This evening, I'd like to start with our scripture reading for our time in the Lord's Word. I'm going to be reading from Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 to 12. If you have your Bible or your app on your phones where you'd like to pull that up, I'll give you a moment to do it again. Matthew chapter 2, we're reading verses 1 through 12. I will remind you, as always, this is God's Word, so let us listen. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, Behold, wise men came from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose, and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and the scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. They told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, For so it is written by the prophet, And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word, that I too may come and worship him. After listening to the king, they went on their way. And behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. And behold, when they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they fell down and they worshipped him. Then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. Join me in prayer. Lord, this evening as we remember the birth of Jesus, Lord, and uh, as we meditate upon all that this means for us, I pray that, God, you will fill us with hearts of worship that like those wise men, we will resolve to come to Jesus, to bow before him, to worship him, and to give our lives and gifts as an offering. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. This Christmas season, uh, which we call Advent, that's the time we prepare ourselves to celebrate the birth of Christ at Christmas. We've been thinking about this in in terms of why we need Christmas and looking at the the Scripture from that uh, vantage point. We've considered how the Christmas message of the Scripture uh, and of Jesus' birth reminds us that we need Christmas because we need a Savior. Uh, We've read in, in the Scriptures, "...you shall call His name Jesus." for he will save his people from their sins. We've seen in the Christmas story not only that we need God's salvation, his saving work, but we also need his presence in the world and in our lives. So we read all of the things that that surrounded the birth of Christ took place to fulfill the prophecy, the virgins shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. We've seen that God has created us for joy, a recurring theme in the story of Christ's birth, and how that joy is only fulfilled through Jesus. So the the truth here is that we need joy. We are created for it, and we find it in Jesus. We see that so clearly in the message that the angels proclaimed to the shepherds when they said, we bring good news of great joy. That shall be for all the people. You tonight... You've been created for joy. You need joy, and you really only truly have it through Christ. We looked then at the story of Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist, and how his his testimony is our need for God's love. When his son John the Baptist, that would be the one to prepare the people for Jesus. When his son was born, Zechariah spoke these words of praise, the tender mercy of our God has arrived, whereby the sunrise has visited us from on high. We are created to be loved. We need God's love, and in Christ we have it. So tonight we come to our final uh, time in the Advent season of preparation 
Uh, one last thing to think about why we need Christmas. There are plenty of other things we could talk about, but tonight I want to talk about this, briefly this reality. We need Christmas because we need to worship. Now, notice I did not say we ought to worship, right? We should, don't get me wrong. Uh, if we think about God and what he's done for us, if we consider his love, that he would love us enough to send Jesus to save us, Love us enough to send his Holy Spirit to be his presence with us. Loves us enough to fill us with joy and to pour out that love. Yes, of course God is certainly worthy of worship. We ought to worship him. But the truth is that we don't just have the ought to, but we need to worship the Lord. That is what he has created us to do. In this familiar story uh, of the wise men, it gives us a meaningful look into our need to worship. So one of the realities for us as, as created beings is that we are inherently made to worship. See, we didn't create ourselves, did we? I had a, a friend once that I worked with who was not a Christian, but he really liked to talk to me about the Christian faith, and he would like to challenge me. And at one point in his life, he was carrying a lot of guilt. He had done some things. He inherently kind of knew they were wrong, and he felt guilt over those things, but he didn't know what to do with it. And so he would talk to me about it. And finally, one day I said, look, you need to talk to God about this. You know this stuff you've done is wrong. The Bible says we've all sinned. I've done it too. You need to confess this stuff to God. You need to ask him for his forgiveness, and you need to pray and do, deal with him about this. And he knew the gospel. I'd talked to him. And he sort of looked at me with, with some, some uh, disdain, and he said, why in the world do I owe God anything? And I said, well, let me ask you a question. Did you create yourself? He said, no. I said, that's why you owe God something. You didn't create yourself. He created you. You don't have life by your own hand. You have it because God gave it to you. You inherently are indebted to the Lord. And because of that, we are inherently created to worship. See, unfortunately, our sin, remember one of the things we, we realize when we study the scripture about Christmas, we need a savior. We need Jesus to forgive our sins. Well, what happens is our sin twists our hearts and our spirits to the point where we don't know how to worship, or more precisely, we don't know who to worship. If you don't believe me, you can go read the book of Romans and read Romans chapter 1. And what Paul does is Paul describes how sin came into the world and what it has done to us by way of worship. And Paul explains how in all of creation, God's attributes are evident. You know that? You can look around the created world and it tells you there's a creator. And Paul says what the world could know about God, his divine power his eternal power, all of these things, it's evident. That doesn't mean they'll know everything about God, but it means we can inherently know that there is a creator and recognize him as God. But Paul says what people do because of their sin is they don't honor God, they don't thank God. What they do is they become futile in their thinking, foolish in their hearts, and we inevitably trade real worship for phony worship worship. We exchange, Paul says, the glory of the immortal God for idols. We exchange the truth of God for a lie. And what Paul says is when this happens, when our sin permeates us, he says eventually what happens is we serve the creature rather than the creator. You know what creature we like to serve the most? The self, right? Right? What we do is, is inevitably we get to the point where what we really worship, if it is not for Jesus breaking this cycle, what we really worship is ourselves. And so that is what Paul describes. And this is exactly what we see in the story when we look at King Herod, isn't it? Now, it's kind of interesting. We have a story of two that claim they want to worship. The wise men who come from the east who say, we've heard there's going to be a, a savior born. They've heard from other Jewish people that had traveled through their land about a savior that was expected, a Messiah. And they had some signs of when that would happen and where. And so they've come to worship. And Herod says, 
go find him so that I may worship too. Now, Herod's an interesting figure in this story because Herod was a Jewish man. His father was a Jew. He was raised as a Jew. He was the ruler in a region where he served the Roman Empire, ruling over the place where most of the Jewish people lived in a concentrated area. And did you notice there, when, when he wasn't sure why they would come to Jerusalem looking for the one born king of the Jews, who did he consult with? The chief priest of the Jewish people and the scribes of the Jewish people. He knew exactly where to turn. They consulted the Jewish scriptures for him, and they gave him an answer. But despite all of this, King Herod did not have any interest in worshiping the one that was born king of the Jews, did he? See, it was a lie. What Herod wanted to do was to protect and serve Herod's own interests. Herod was actually fearful and jealous that maybe there was going to be someone vying for the adulation and adoration that Herod wanted for himself. You and I may not be kings, but can we fall into the same trap of worshiping the creature rather than the creator? Absolutely. If you look around the world, you will see... If it's not clear in the mirror, you will see the deadly, disastrous effect of worship gone wrong. Because inevitably, what happens when we worship the creature rather than the creator is we destroy one another and ourselves. You look around the world, you will see hatred, violence, injustice, wars, unhappiness, depression, anxiety, emptiness, all of these kinds of things that are symptoms of worship misgiven or misguided. Mother Teresa, you've probably heard of her, devoted her life to serving the poor, destitute, and sick people of the slums of India. And Mother Teresa, many years ago before she died, was interviewed once to ask about her life, why she devoted herself to this kind of life. Why would she go live in slums and serve poor people and sick people in India? And Mother Teresa said, the spiritual poverty of the Western world, this is our part of the world, and this was was in the 70s, but it's still true. She said, the spiritual poverty of the Western world is far greater than the physical poverty of our people in India. You in the West have millions of people who suffer terrible loneliness and emptiness. They feel unloved and unwanted. These people are not hungry in the physical sense, like the people of India, but they are hungry in another way. They know they need something more than money, yet they don't know what it is. This is a commentary on worship. You see, what we need is worship. We need to discover that God's creation is about more than me. It's about more than just you. God's creation has a greater purpose than for me to simply accumulate more stuff or more money or more achievements or more sense of self-worth. There's a bigger picture than me. There's a greater power at work in the world than my own strength, which in life fails me so often, and in death fails every single one of us. All of our strength does not amount to much. There is something, and we know it, there's someone at work in the world that is bigger, wiser, more righteous, better in every way than we are. But the problem is too many people don't know who or what that is. In other words, like Mother Teresa said, we desperately need to worship, but we don't know who to give that worship to. Well, what is the answer to this dilemma. Let me suggest it's Christmas. We need Christmas because we need to worship. And we worship one way or another, whether it's the right one or the wrong one. But see, in sending his son, what God has done is revealed himself to us, God with us, so that we could worship him. He's given himself in order to save us from worshiping ourselves or some other creature or part of creation. And he has given us the gift of worship, the gift that he gave to those wise men. And when they found Jesus, what did they do? They bowed before him. They rejoiced when they got to him and they worshiped. 
And notice God protected them as they went on their way. God's presence was with them. So tonight, it is my prayer and my hope that we, too, will worship Christ who was born for us. It is my prayer that we will worship Him not only because we ought to, though we should, but because we need to. Because we recognize we are the creature and we owe everything to our Creator all the more because He sent His Son to save us. So I give thanks tonight for Jesus, the Son of God, who made all things and who came to make all things right, including who and how we will worship. So tonight, let us worship Christ the Lord.